um, for this morning. And then yesterday, I had the opportunity to enjoy a very interesting homily given by a fascinating man, Bishop Michael Curry, who is the head of the Episcopal Church at the wedding of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. That man laid down the word right there in Windsor Chapel, did he not? I got to tell you, I thought seriously about throwing out my sermon and playing that this morning for all y'all. If you haven't seen it, please go see it. I'm going to share from you some excerpts from that message um, as our reading today. Do go back, keep reading this. Don't forget, this is our book of the month. Um, but I am going to read to you a few excerpts from that message today. And if you haven't had a chance to see the message that he gave in Windsor Castle, you guys, like it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing demonstration of the power when two people make a decision to participate in creating a world that works for all. You see Martin Luther King being quoted from the pulpit in Windsor Castle. You see a gospel choir singing at a royal wedding, and you hear a black man give a sermon that contains these kinds of words. I won't be able to give you his inflection. I'm going to read it like a white girl, sorry. <laughs> you got to go with what you got, right? Bishop Curry said this, excerpted from his larger message. Someone once said that Jesus began the most revolutionary movement in human history, a movement grounded in the unconditional love of God for the world, and a movement mandating people to live and love, and in so doing, to change not only their lives, but the very life of the world itself. I'm talking about some power, real power, the power to change the world. Think and imagine a world where love is the way. Imagine our homes and families when love is the way. Imagine neighborhoods and communities where love is the way. Imagine governments and nations where love is the way. Imagine business and commerce when love is the way. Imagine this tired old world when love is the way. When love is the way, unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive. When love is the way, then no child would go to bed hungry in this world ever again. When love is the way, we will let justice roll down like a mighty stream and righteousness like an ever-flowing brook. When love is the way, poverty will become history. When love is the way, the earth will become a sanctuary. When love is the way, we will lay down our swords and shields by the riverside to study war no more. When love is the way, there's plenty good room. Plenty good room for all of God's children. Because when love is the way, we actually treat each other, well, like we are actually family. When love is the way, we know that God is the source of us all. And we are brothers and sisters, children of God, brothers and sisters. That's a new heaven, a new earth, a new world, a new human family. Hallelujah. I'm going to read through today's affirmation once, and then I will invite you to join me. I say yes to a world that works for all, free of fear and anchored in faith. I walk boldly forward in love, accepting myself and others with an open heart. Please stand and join me in re reading our affirmation with conviction and heart. I say yes to a world that works for all, free of fear and anchored in faith. I walk boldly forward in love, accepting myself and others with an open heart, and so it is. Have you ever felt alone? The 
mantra, if you will, that our choir just sang is the spiritual truth, right? We cannot possibly be alone. That which is closer than our neck vein, nearer than our hands and feet, is always with us. It lives us, it breathes us, it gave birth to us. It is that to which we return. We cannot be separate from it. For it is all there is, and we are something. Right? We cannot be separated from it. And yet, I felt alone. I've had experiences where I didn't feel that deep connection with the God of my being. I've had moments where I forgot to recognize that deep connection with the God of your being. And that we are really one. Because there can be no separation and no duality. There can only be one life. The life of the divine. That life that is living us. Breathing us. And you know, I found that when I forget that, I fall into some behaviors and practices that are not my core values. You? I find that I behave badly sometimes toward people. Or, in some ways even more insidious, I just think badly of them. See, then we get to behave badly and nobody knows it but us. <laughs> Here's the catch, though. The universe knows it. Because there is only one mind. That mind is God's mind. I am thinking from and into that mind. And when I am thinking judgment, when I am thinking fear, when I am thinking blame, when I am thinking shame, when I am thinking hate. What? Do you think the mind of God doesn't notice that? And because it is done unto us according to our consciousness, that comes back to bite us on the you-know-what. Has this ever happened to you? Am I just talking to me? Am I sitting here back here? Oh, no. uh, I, uh, oh, it's just me. Okay, well, then I guess we're good. Um, I'm going to take my sermon and just go home and read it. <laughs> Here's the thing. When we forget that we are one, essentially what happens is we begin to exclude ourselves and others from the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is right where we are, yes? And as I, when, I, when, when I forget that and I move into judgment, I'm excluding myself from the joys of the kingdom. I'm excluding myself from the joys of love. I am excluding my neighbor, the people around me, from the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of love. What? Have you ever felt excluded? Have you ever felt like you didn't belong? Have you ever excluded anyone? Now, what is this kingdom? This kingdom is a kingdom of wholeness. You know, we talk about God qualities here, and to me, this is one of the most important spiritual principles that we teach, because um, a quality of God is something we can aspire to. I don't know about you, but, but the term God is kind of like, what? Yeah, okay. In fact, one of our kids was talking to me earlier today about, you know, who created God and where did all those things we can't see come from, right? And you know, the truth is, we don't know the answer to that question. We wrestle with some ideas around it because it's kind of, you know, it's all over the place, right? But what we do, can do is we can aspire to embody qualities of God. And so we begin to attempt to identify some of those qualities of God, like wholeness. What is wholeness? Well, if you look at the human definition of wholeness, wholeness is just a completeness, right? If you have a whole pie, there is not a piece missing, right? If you have a whole deck of cards, there's 52 cards, every one of them the right name and face and color, and two jacks. That's a whole deck, right? 
unless it's a pinochle deck, which is a different bit, but, but it's still a whole different deck. <laughs> if something is whole, there is nothing missing from it. And let me posit this idea that one of the qualities of God is wholeness. Is there anything missing from the universe? It is an infinite wholeness, an infinite oneness, right? And you see, this is why that notion of oneness, unity, is so perfect, because, because nothing can be outside of the body of God. Nothing is missing. Now, do you feel like something might be missing from your life sometimes? Am I talking to me again? I'm talking to the room. Sometimes we feel like, you know, things might be missing from our lives, but the, fat, the spiritual truth, the quality of God of wholeness, the capital T truth, is that nothing is missing. Nothing is wrong. <laughs> nothing is missing. And as I anchor in that, I begin to recognize a greater truth about my oneness and unity with all things. The universe is a whole thing. What's true of God is true of you, for you are created in its image and likeness. You are a piece of the whole. You cannot be separate from the whole. So why do we feel separate? Why do we exclude? If wholeness is a quality of God and we can embody that quality, why do we feel separate? Why do we feel excluded? Why do we exclude? Why do we do things Like, call the police when a black woman is napping in a dorm room, in a dorm common area. Why do we do things like shoot our schoolmates? Why do we do things like go to war? Why do we do things that prove our belief in our separateness and our exclusion? And you know, I can give you, those are the big examples, right? And I could give you a longer list of big examples if you want it. It's enough for me. But we do it in a million small ways every day, don't we? Do you ever count how many things are in the, the person's cart in the line ahead of you in the quick checkout? <laughs> and then make a judgment about that person? I did that just the other day. I counted, he had 16 in the 15 checkout line. <laughs> I was in a hurry, you guys. <laughs> and that one item, I'm sure, made a big difference in how quickly I got out of that grocery store. And so I felt fully justified in standing in judgment behind this guy, excluding him from the wholeness, the heart of completeness, the heart of love. Let's go back to uh, Bishop Curry for a second. That's not him. When love is the way, we treat each other well like we are actually family. And I don't mean like we treated our sister when we were having fights. You know what I mean? I don't mean that. I mean like family, like family that you love even when you don't like them. Does anybody have a family member that you love even though you don't like them? <laughs> Please. <laughs> right? but they're family and you love them anyway. We treat each other like we are family. When love is the way, we know that God is the source of us all. A new heaven, a new earth, a new human family is created out of this recognition that love is the way. And wholeness is the key, understanding that we cannot be separate from our neighbor. And when we harm our neighbor, we harm the very body of God. We have separated ourselves from the kingdom and we harm the very body of God. Now our theme this month, as you guys know, is creating a world that works for all. And we've established in week one that, you know, the world doesn't really work for everybody, does it? It works a little better for some people and it works a lot better for some people than it does for others, yeah? Yeah. And we established in week one that there are kind of three characteristics of a, of a world that works for all. The first one is enoughness. That is, everybody has enough. In our world right now, I, I can't honestly say that everybody has enough. The second characteristic of a world that works for all is exchangeability. That is, any one of us would be willing to change places with any other one. It doesn't necessarily mean I'd prefer to change places with someone else, 
but I could change places and still have my basic needs met and not feel punished by the exchange. That's the second characteristic of a world that works for all. And the third characteristic is common benefit. That is, the system works for the benefit of everyone rather than the benefit of a few. So those are the three characteristics of a world that works for everyone. And we talked about that in depth in week one. In week two, we talked about the problems of the world. Because it's important for us to not deny the problems, right? And sometimes in our teaching, especially because we like to put our focus, and it is a good spiritual practice to put our focus on what's working, sometimes we need to stop and assess what's not working. Because we do not deny the condition. We deny that the condition has any power, and we can only change that which we know about. Right? If we don't know about it, we can't make it better. Uh, I, I'm reminded of a friend of mine who was um, had, um, what do you call that, numbness um, in, in, in his leg because he, um, he had diabetes, right? And he couldn't feel things in his leg and he injured himself and he didn't realize it, right? And he's walking around not knowing how hurt he is. We can't numb ourselves to the realities of the world. I mean, that person's life was threatened by not recognizing. See, our entire good is threatened by not recognizing the pain of the world, that we have separated ourselves from others, that we are denying ourselves and them, the experience of the kingdom of love, the kingdom of wholeness. So that was week two, looking at the problem. <laughs> Jeez, that was kind of a big week. And we ended week two talking about what really has to take place is a revolution in consciousness, right? An evolution or a revolution in consciousness because consciousness created things, right? Our consciousness created our experience of the world and not just our experience but our collective experience of the world, our individual and collective experience of the world is created in consciousness and the same consciousness that created it can create something new. Things don't have to stay the way they are. We can be powerful generators of love. When love is the way, we know that God is the source of us all, that we are infinitely connected. And so today we're talking about how we tend to exclude and forget the spiritual truth of wholeness and oneness. Right? And I want to talk to you about some things that we can do to engage in a spiritual practice of inclusion. That is, how do we do our lives as though love is already the way? How do we do our lives as though love is already the way? It's not. <laughs> we might have moments of that or even stretches of that. But overall, love is not our way, is it? We exclude, we blame, we shame, we judge in the small ways, in the checkout line, and in the big ways, in violence. So, the spiritual practice of inclusion, what would that look like? I think, uh, you know, I've been kind of wrestling with this this week, and, and I kind of am um, anchored in two things that we need to do. The first thing we have to do is be prepared in consciousness. We have to create fertile internal soil to go out and be in the world what is essentially against the way of the world, right? Because the way of the world says withhold, hoard. The way of the world says there's not enough, walk in fear, protect your own. And so we have to prepare in consciousness to stand up and say, mm, not my truth, not my reality, that's not how I experience it, and then be inclusive, okay? So we must first prepare in mind through our spiritual practice. And I am talking about a daily dedicated spiritual practice. We always start with prayer and meditation. We pray upon wholeness, we meditate on wholeness. One life, one power, one presence, one God, one infinite wholeness that is perfect, whole, and complete right now. Nothing is wrong in the mind or the body of God. And I may have all of this human appearance that the world doesn't work, but that is a symptom of a state of consciousness. 
and I must embody a new state of consciousness in order for the symptom to subside. And so I do my prayer and meditation work, anchoring in a consciousness of wholeness. Nothing wrong, nothing missing. Everything is included in the kingdom of love. And from that place, I can begin to walk in the way of love. So we start there. How many of you do that every day? Some of us probably to some degree. Some of us are guys. I just saw one person go. <laughs> that was really cute. You know who you are. <laughs> so the first thing we do is we prepare ourselves in consciousness to be inclusive. To be that beacon of love that we are called to be so that we can create that world that works for all. From this place, anchored in this place, and I'm talking about, you know, God is all there is, I am one with God. God is love, I am love. God is wholeness, I am wholeness. You see, we, we start with the general and we bring it into the particular and recognize that what is true of the nature of God, what is true of the nature of the universe is true of me. And then we're anchored in something new, aren't we? How many of you walk around most of the time anchored in fear and lack and not enough? Many of us do, right? So let's anchor in something new. And then from this place, from this place, this consciousness of wholeness, this consciousness of love, we begin in our preparation stage a rigorous, rigorous path of introspection. We ask ourselves the hard questions. And one of the hardest questions we can ask ourselves is where do I fit in the hierarchy of power in our culture? Where do I fit? There is a hierarchy of power, right? In general, and this is not 100% so, but in general, the hierarchy of power looks like this. At the top of the heap is who? White, wealthy, male, right? And ding, 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 and down at the bottom tends to be people of color, poor people, people who perhaps haven't had the same opportunities, that kind of thing, right? There is a hierarchy, and we all have a place in the hierarchy, don't we? One of the ways that we talk about this is privilege. There's relative privilege in the hierarchy, right? I have more privilege than a poor white woman, right? Somebody else has more privilege than me. Somebody else has more privilege than that somebody else. Somebody else has less. It's a hierarchy. And it's endemic to our culture. Our system is based on that hierarchy of power, isn't it? Now, I don't want to make the hierarchy of power wrong. We have evolved it. It is created in consciousness. And we continue to walk in it by our consent. The challenge with it is the higher up the hierarchy you are, the harder it is to see where you are, which is why I say a rigorous process of introspection. You see, the higher up the hierarchy you are, the easier it is to ignore what doesn't work about the world, right? You have more resources, you have more money. I was reading an article last night that was really breaking my heart about something that's going on in the world. And you know what I realized? I have the option to close the paper and stop reading it, right? The person who's in that experience doesn't have that option. And I realized that's an example of privilege in my life. I have the privilege to, when it gets too painful, turn away from it and go read my novel that's entertaining and peaceful, <laughs> right? But if I am in the experience of that, I don't have that option. Make sense? And so we have to ask ourselves the hard questions. Where do I fit? How do I benefit? Remember we said the third characteristic of a world that works for all is the system is for common benefit. Where do I benefit from this hierarchy of power and where do I not? It's also good to note that. 
But you see, I'm doing that from a place where I'm anchored in love and wholeness and the awareness that all is well in the universe on the grand scale, on the spiritual principle scale, and yet I am a human being having a human experience, and because there is only one life, I am responsible for all of life, not just my life. I am responsible for how everyone experiences life on planet Earth because I cannot be separate from them. I am charged by God to include everyone in the kingdom. Am I willing to ask myself the hard questions about how I benefit from the system so that I can, from a place of greater self-awareness, serve the very heart of God, bring the love that is the way into being on planet Earth. You see, because... Actually, I'm not going to go there. Never mind. The third preparation... See, we're still preparing in consciousness here, right? We haven't even done anything out in the world yet. We're preparing in consciousness. And the third thing we have to think about when we're preparing in consciousness is we need to recognize and bless our fears around this. Yikes. You know, I mean, I benefit from the system. I'm afraid I might lose something if I acknowledge that. I'm afraid I might lose my well-being. I'm afraid my family might lose some of their well-being. I'm afraid I might lose some of my power. I'm afraid I might lose some of my choice. I'm afraid of change. Some of us, we don't even care if it's good change. We're just scared of it. Yes? Because we don't know what's going to happen if we engage at this deep, heartfelt level with creating a world that works for all. It's scary. We become as vulnerable as those who are at the bottom of the hierarchy of power when we become willing to stand in these kinds of questions and face our fears. And if you're not afraid, I don't know. Really? If you lost everything, that brings up no fear in you? Now, I can stay anchored in the presence and the awareness of wholeness and that God is good and all is well. Even if I lose everything, somehow that would be for my benefit because God is for me, the universe is for me. I can know that conceptually, but if I were in the process of losing everything, it might be a little more difficult for me to not be in fear, right? So we have to be able to rest peacefully in the possibility. We have to be able to rest peacefully in the possibility of anything. Anything could happen. But because I am anchored in love, and love is the way, and I am anchored in the awareness of wholeness, I know that nothing and no one can harm me. And so I can risk, I can risk loving others. I can risk including others. See, our fears exclude, right? Our fears exclude. When we are in fear, we push away. And I got to tell you, it doesn't work anymore. It worked when we were small kind of tribal things, right? But we have too much technology, too much population, too many people to feed, too many people who need water. We have too much going on for that to work anymore. The world is too complex for exclusion based on fear to work anymore. So we are doing our spiritual practice. We are anchoring in the consciousness that the universe is complete, that God is love, that I am love. We are asking ourselves the hard questions about where we fit in the system and how does the system benefit us. And we are recognizing and facing and blessing any fear that comes up. And what is the cool thing about courage? Courage doesn't mean you don't have any more fear. Courage means you feel the fear and do it anyway, right? So we feel fear and we go about creating a world that works for everyone anyway. Because that is the divine call. That is what is being asked of us. 
Okay, so are you ready? Now you've done all your working consciousness, right? You got it done in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> it's a process, right? Every day, we got to do this stuff every day. And we have new revelations every day. Now, as we do this work, we become prepared to act in the world. And by act in the world, I mean act as though love is already the way. He's, ta he's painting the picture of a future in his message here, isn't he? Imagine a world, imagine a world. Okay, we've imagined it, now we have to act as though it's already here. Even if it doesn't look like it's here. Yikes. But that's the spiritual path, isn't it? The way we act as though it's already here, we build relationships. We include. We include. And here's the, <laughs> here's the hard part. And I have to say, you know, this is not my favorite part of the book. I get it that it's true. And it calls me to a bigger beingness. I must connect. I must interact with community, with all people, even the ones I don't like. Yikes. Even the ones who are different from me. Even the ones who are my potential enemies. Even the ones who hold a different politics than I do. A different spiritual value than I do. I must build relationships with those people and recognizing that we're all created by the one. No one and nothing is separate. And if you're here and you think differently than I do and you believe differently than I do, the way of love says, I love you. I don't care what you believe. I recognize our common humanity. I recognize that we are one in the spirit, that we cannot be separate. And the diversity is the nature of the divine. You just got to look out at nature to see that. It's all we need to do. And so my first thing to do is to reach out and build relationships with everyone, but in particular with people who are different than I am. And one of the things that um, Sharif Abdullah says in the book, he says, this is more important than solving problems. It's more important than solving problems. The reason is the problems solve themselves as we build relationships with one another. As we recognize our common humanity, then people start to realize, oh, well, yeah, you do have an interest here, don't you? And you do have, yeah, okay, you know, and then problems begin to solve themselves. Resolution and solutions begin to present themselves, and we become willing participants in the consciousness of wholeness in the world. So we connect and we interact. And we acknowledge that even if we exclude others, we are still one. We depend on one another. We need one another. We cannot do this life alone. And I don't just need Ken in the front row here, and I don't just need Kathy next to Ken. I need the whole world. I need everyone. Because the universe is an infinite wholeness. And everyone and everything is a part of that wholeness. And when something is happening over here in the wholeness, it has an impact on me. My job, I'm responsible for the whole world. What? But you know what? When we can own that with a sense of joy and connection, and then we look for our own little piece of the world, what relationships do I need to build? Where can I make a difference? How many of you read a book called Heart Politics in the 80s? What? We're all New Thought people. Everybody in New Thought was reading Heart Politics in the 80s. What? <laughs> you know, go get this book if you can. Um, I don't know if it's even still in print. It's called Heart Politics, and the author is Fran Peavy. And she um, is a woman who was a teacher. She was a white woman who was a teacher in a school, I think it was in San Francisco, in a poor neighborhood, her students were people of color, and she got in that school and she realized she knew nothing. She had no idea how to be a teacher who was inclusive and loving, and who understood this concept of wholeness. And uh, it's a beautiful book, and ultimately what she did was she quit her job, and she sold her home, and she traveled the world, and she traveled the world with a sign. And she would sit in public places 
in Japan and in the Middle East and in Europe and all over the world, and the sign said, American willing to listen. And she listened. She listened. She built relationships with people who were different than she was. She acknowledged the oneness of all things. And then she educated herself. We must educate ourselves. Once again, it's the same thing, you know, when we talk about that hierarchy of power, that hierarchy of privilege, um, uh, you know, we have to educate ourselves about that. We have to educate ourselves about how we've been blessed and perhaps others haven't. We have to come to understand that part of our beingness is wising up about how things are, how they got that way, and what is our role in bringing the kingdom alive for everyone, creating the way of love for everyone. Now, I have gone on. I want to say one quick more thing about Bishop Curry. He said at the end of this message, he said, the discovery of this kind of love, he, quoted, he was quoting Teilhard de Chardin, the French philosopher, and he said, the discovery of this kind of love is equivalent to the discovery of fire. How the technology of fire changed us. It, it completely shifted the whole evolution of humanity. And what he said and what Deschardins said is that the discovery of this kind of unconditional love where everyone is included in the kingdom will have the same impact on humanity and on our evolution as the discovery of fire. Love is the new fire. And I love it that this is Pentecost Sunday. If you come from a more traditional background, you know this is the day that the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples and the people of Jesus, and they experienced the fire. And we celebrate in the traditional Christian uh, uh, teaching, we, we celebrate the Pentecost with a symbol of fire, don't we? Fire of love is that which can open our hearts to a greater sense of inclusion, recognizing that the infinite wholeness of all things is right where we are. And we can release our fear and move into it with faith and confidence. So what I want to invite you to do right now is turn within with me and breathe in to the depths of your being, relaxing your body, relaxing into your chair, remembering the spiritual truth of who and whose you are. And as you breathe in, recognize that there is a spark of divinity deep at the core of you. And I invite you to envision that spark, that light, that fire that is at the center of you. The fire of love. And as you breathe in, you become more and more aware of this inner essence of love. And you feel that flame growing at the center of your being and filling your entire self as you open your heart more and more fully to love. And the spark becomes a flame and burns brightly at the center of you. And I invite you now to simply open your mind to the divine idea that there is only one life, one presence, one infinite wholeness. And we are all members of this divine pattern, this infinite presence. We never have been, we never could be excluded, for we belong to God. And as you feel this awareness just burning deep within you, allow yourself to know that it is safe to love. It is safe. to simply allow the presence of love to radiate forth as you. And just begin to see yourself anchored in love, doing your life just a little bit differently, including just a little more. Anchoring a little more fully.
fully in the qualities of love and holiness. Cultivating relationships anchored in love. Allowing yourself to be present to the infinite heart of God. Allowing God's heart to be your heart. For that is the truth of you. And so we simply remember together that this is the truth of us. That we are anchored every moment of every day in this loving heart of God and so we can go forth with faith and confidence asking the hard questions, wrestling with the truth, being the ones who create the way of love here on planet Earth. with a grateful heart, and so it is. Amen.